Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Art in the Wild. I have my mic working this time. Last time on my episode with Matt, it was not working, and I thought I was recording this awesome audio of myself talking, but I was just on the computer mic. Um, but yeah, so today we are going to be talking about light. I'm with Elliot Beery. He's an 18-year-old wildlife photographer based in Oregon, and I'll let him talk a little bit more about himself. Yeah, so I got started in photography about uh, three years three years ago, right around mm-hmm. the start of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like, I feel like I was a part of like a whole generation of wildlife photographers that started right around <laughs> yeah. the pandemic. Yeah. I'm just a lot of people who got into it. And yeah, uh, being in the Pacific Northwest, there's a lot of amazing opportunities to photograph wildlife and just so much to see. Mm-hmm. So that was, I mean, if you're a wildlife photographer, Oregon is a very good place to be, especially to very. grow up in. Yeah. Um, in terms of wildlife, I really my focus is just any any wildlife that mm-hmm. I I want to photograph. I just you know will go after. I don't really have like a specialty. I would say I guess birds probably would be my main focus, but I definitely want to do more mammal work and other stuff in the future. Yeah. Yeah, I'd imagine birds are the easiest to photograph in that area, too. I mean, mammals are there, but so looking at like the animals you're photographing and the mammals and birds and stuff, what was the first animal? I asked this question to uh, Matt last time. I'm probably going to ask this to everybody, but what was the first encounter with the wild animal that really got you into wildlife photography? Hmm. That's a hard question because... The way I kind of started with wildlife photography was a little bit weird because it started out as a biology assignment. Oh, yeah. And then my dad, my dad was like, you should photograph uh, the birds for your biology assignment. And mm-hmm. then I just kind of got handed a camera and was like, you should go out and photograph birds. <laughs> yeah, so it wasn't it was a little interesting that I didn't really it wasn't one species that like started me. It was more just like the situation. Yeah. But I would say that. um my backyard birds like acorn woodpeckers and um western tanagers in particular mm-hmm. are both birds that really like caught my interest and i was like whoa these are super cool birds and i <laughs> yeah. want to get better photos of them that aren't like straight up in a tree mm-hmm. like far away um but i think also like just more broadly throughout like my, my whole life I would say back when I was a kid, um, I had my dad was really into finding reptiles mm-hmm. um, in, in the backyard and around where we lived. And I remember I went out with him once and we went up into the mountains and we went and found snakes and he he was taking photos of them. Yeah. And I watched him and it was just a really cool experience that got me just kind of really interested in wildlife from that mm-hmm. point on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's funny. So, like, you weren't even into, like, birding before. You just kind of picked up the camera. You're like, wait, these are super cool. And then just kind of went from there. Yeah. That's yeah. that's one of the more unique stories I've heard. That's really awesome. Um, So, when you started, right, you started to pick up the camera for the assignment. You start taking pictures of your birds. You're like, holy crap, these are awesome, right? What mm-hmm. did the first, like, beginning stages of your photography look like? And, like, whatever you – because I consider my beginning stage to be the first five years of my photography, right? But that's going to be different for everybody. So what did the beginning stages kind of look like for you? What were you focusing on and things like that? Uh, I was focusing on just getting a sharp image of a bird that I could identify. Because yeah. I was really focused on wanting to know what the bird was. Mm-hmm. So to get a clear enough photo that I could – identify the bird was kind of the biggest first that was probably like the first few months was just I just wanted to get as close to the bird as possible and just take a photo of it and I didn't know a camera yeah. very well so yeah. that even that was hard sometimes <laughs> yeah yeah I got you um yeah and I think that over time I kind of just honed in on like for instance uh western tangers like i from the start, I was like, I really want to get better photos of these birds. So I kind of focused in on that species yeah. in the few, first few months. Like, I want to get a picture of this beautiful, colorful bird. So I spent more of my time looking for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's like a common theme among most most people. Fortunately, fortunately for you, though, it only lasted a couple months. I was stuck there for like five years, um, <laughs> you know, but 
so you everyone starts in this stage of just like getting into it and you just want a sharp photo of an animal that's cool right how did you start progressing past that and specifically with light like how did you start noticing light since that is our topic but also how did you start becoming more creative in a more general sense because I talked about um, on my first episode it was like I got into it because I got introduced to a group chat of these people who didn't give me ide- these ideas, but they exposed me to those ideas. And that's where it came mm-hmm. from for me. And I know you knew that story because you're in the group chat. Um, <laughs> but how how did you start getting into it? Like, did you just start to naturally hone in on that? Or like, did you come across some videos on YouTube that you used to approve? Like, how did that go? I would say it was almost purely just me experimenting in the field and just seeing like what looked good, like what I personally liked. Yeah. For the most part. Um, like, I don't think I really, especially in like the first several months, I didn't know. I mean, I didn't really know what was good light and what was bad light. All I know is, all I knew is that some images turned out better than others. Like, mm-hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. But I think over time, okay. So yeah, I really, I think for my, so I started in, in around April Mm -hmm. um, is when I started photography. And then in the fall, I had my birthday. And for my birthday, my dad, who's a photographer, got me a book about bird photography and just like covering all aspects of bird photography. And that book gave me a ton of just ideas of what I wanted to try out. Mm -hmm. Because in the book, it was like talking about all this stuff that was obviously went way over my head. Yeah. But it got me out like at sunrise and sunset just experimenting Mm -hmm. and through that i would say i just like through the experience of just going out at those times i was like i actually really like this light like um close to sunrise and sunset Mm -hmm. and i would say like there was like one moment where i really like i realized that i kind of understood what light was and what it did in the photograph was i i got up at like 2 30 a.m this was a few weeks after I got my driver's license. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I drove up to this mountain lake and I photographed shorebirds at the crack of dawn backlit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that was the moment where I was like, okay, I know what light looks good. And <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I photographed, I think it was, um, I think it was Western sandpipers that I mm-hmm. photographed. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that experience really like, made me realize I really want to photograph stuff at like sunrise and sunset and focus on that. Yeah. And how long, so how long ago, uh, sorry, I didn't catch this. How long was that after you picked up the camera? Like when did, how long was that beginner transition to like actually recognizing these things? I would say about almost exactly a year. A year. That's impressive, dude. I was five years. I was going out there and not paying (laughs) any attention. And I, the thing is I didn't even pick up on like, Oh, this light looks better. I was just like, Oh, I like this image more. And I don't know why, you know, Mm -hmm. but, um, looking back at that book that you got right now that you're more like fit into your style and you really know what you like and you know what you think is good and everything like that. Looking back, how do you view the advice that's in the book now? Do you agree with most of it? Or are there are some things that you're like, eh, you know, I don't really agree with it fully or. Um, I would say there's some things I'm like, oh, those are good. That's good general advice. But there's definitely a bunch of stuff in it that's like, I don't think is very helpful Yeah, yeah. to you really use. What, the biggest thing and that this was from the book and also like other resources I had was mm-hmm. it was like always shoot front lit on the bird. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's the biggest piece of advice I kept on seeing. Mm-hmm. And that's just not good advice whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. that was, that was like, I just saw that everywhere when I was first starting. And now I look back at that and think, well, no, you don't want to always shoot front lit at all. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, agreed. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Cause there's a bunch of these rules that like people have, and they're not necessarily bad rules for an individual, but it's like always shoot front lit or make sure you're on F 12 to make sure the whole body is in focus or something like that. So I wanted to see if after you had become more settled in your style, if you could look back on it and be like, okay, well maybe not all of this is great advice, mm-hmm. but there's definitely, you know, some good general tips that you can take out yeah. of that. Now looking at light, the reason why I wanted to get you on for this is because I think your use of light is like really exceptional. Um, but do you think that light is the most important element in a photograph or do you think it's like 
it's interlocked with a bunch of different things or how do you view that? That's yeah, that's a complicated question. Mm -hmm. I think that, yeah, that kind of gets at like what a photograph even is, yeah. which is a really complicated question that <laughs> I don't think anyone can really answer. Mm -hmm. Like, um, but I, I would say that for a photograph, I would say that like the story of the photograph or just the, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it, but like the essence of the photo is what's yeah. most important. Mm -hmm. And that light is very important in creating that, but it's not like the only, the most important component. Yeah. But it's like equal um, with other components, right? You think? Yeah, I would say yeah. so. I think I would agree. Um, It's how I usually view it is, I don't know if this is a good way to explain it, but this is what I usually say is it's kind of like three pillars and one of them is light, the other one is composition, and then the last one is like spatial awareness and being aware mm -hmm. in the field, aware enough to consciously think about your surroundings and intentionally incorporate those surroundings into your environment in an, an intentional way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's like paying attention to make sure you shoot in good light, make sure you compose your images appropriately based upon like the elements that are in it and where your subject is facing, and then also being aware enough to be like, okay, I have a Pacific Wren on this stick. There's a huge nasty bush behind it that looks terrible. Mm -hmm. But if I move two feet over here, the image is going to look great. Mm -hmm. I think post-processing is also a part of it too. Oh yeah. Because oh, um, yeah. like, I know some really awesome photographers, you know, and they take really good images. And I like, not, not like personally, but like, you know, I see people on Instagram, I'll take a really great shot and it's a great shot, but it looks very dull and the colors aren't, mm -hmm. Because, like, in a, a camera isn't capturing what is exactly there a lot of the time. You know what I'm saying? And I think it can – I think – I don't know. I don't know if it's on the same level as all those other, in like, in-field shooting tactics, but it's up there. Because I think it's important to know how to post-process your image to even yes. just get it how it looks, you know, how it was mm – -hmm. how it looked in real life, you know? Yeah. Um, this is – I wanted to ask this in the beginning, but I completely forgot – so this is a little bit off topic. Before we get back into light, though, you are in college right now. You're working on a marbled murlet project, right? Did I pronounce that right? Uh, murlet is murlet. how okay. I pronounce it. But... Okay, yeah. Can you, like, talk yeah. a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so basically um, I'm working, helping out on a project called the Oregon Marbled Murlet Project, mm -hmm. which is a federally funded conservation project studying marble murlets along the Oregon coast. Yeah. Because before this study, basically we didn't know really anything about the nesting habits of marble murlets mm -hmm. whatsoever. Yeah. And basically what this study did is they spent several years going out in the field, doing radio tagging marble murlets out at sea mm -hmm. and then watching and um, locating where they flew in, finding the nest and then setting up basically really high quality trail cameras up at the marble murlet nests. Mm -hmm. And then from that, they got several years. I think it was like five or six years worth of tons and tons of nests filmed and recorded everything that happened at those nests. Mm -hmm. And they did this uh, for several years. And then just last year, they had their last year of um, setting up the cameras and so now they're looking through all of their footage that they got yeah, yeah. from that. And that's a massive, massive job looking through that footage and understanding what's even happening in it. Like, um, and what my job is in the lab is looking through the video of the nest and basically recording what is actually happening. Like, is the parent, like, is the parent bringing fish to the nest or is it brooding the nest? Um, is and especially important is like how what happens to the chick does the chick fledge successfully mm -hmm. does it get eaten by a predator <laughs> yeah has and that happened when you're watching it yet not yet okay not good. Yet. that's good uh yeah so basically my part in the project is looking through the results of all this footage they have and basically recording all of the data and then at some point i hopefully will be able to help in like the analysis of it Mm -hmm. um yeah and it's been it's been really awesome because it's just so cool to kind of dive deep into the, like the life history of 
marble merlets and really learn a lot about them just from like looking at their nests and watching the, their behavior over hours and hours and hours of footage. Yeah. And yeah, it's been really cool. Yeah. I know that was random, completely out of topic, but I, I, I realized when we were talking about like, I'm like, I forgot to talk about that. And I was like, well, <laughs> I'll just skip it. I'll, you know, but then I was like, no, we have to talk about that. Cause that's really cool. The babies are so adorable. Mm-hmm. they're like so cute if yeah. anyone doesn't know what they look like i would recommend looking them up because they're just really cute but what's like okay one more last question about this and we'll switch back to light but what's like the cutest thing or like the most interesting thing you've seen out of that footage hmm, that's interesting um most interesting thing i've seen probably like the interaction between the parents mm-hmm. um my the current nest that i'm watching footage for the parents um come at the same time every morning and evening which is kind of weird usually it's the parent parents alternate one comes in the morning one comes in the evening and so it's interesting to see them both land on the nest and then basically get in this little line to feed the chick (laughs) yeah and then one parent will feed the chick and then the next one will walk forward feed the chick and it's just it's really funny to see both parents interact like that because with a lot of birds the parents like the males will just kind of abandon the nest and the female will be responsible for taking care of the chicks but with marble yeah. merlets both the parents play equal part so it's just mm-hmm. really cool to see them interact yeah that's really cool yeah sorry so yeah we're done with that uh um interruption but i just thought it was <laughs> necessary to talk about because it was super cool but yeah back to light so yeah i i would agree that light is kind of one element that is equal with a, a very um a handful that are like all at the top of the most important mm-hmm. elements in making a photo now looking at the different lighting conditions i usually separate them into four categories now you could sub like you could divide these into a bunch of different categories themselves but these are the four i usually work with or i talk about and that's golden light hard light diffused light and blue hour would you i mean there's also like if you have an f 2.8 and a great like an r3 or something you can shoot at nighttime pretty much Mm -hmm. or there's also artificial light so like lamps and things like that but would you agree that like you know golden hard diffused and blue is blue hour is kind of like good yeah i would definitely say just putting stuff in a broad categories that that would be good especially under like under normal shooting conditions because Photographing stuff at night is not something that people usually do. Yeah, but yeah. there's a bunch of different stuff, but these are the ones I find myself or most people usually working in. Now, first one I want to talk about is golden because I have a hunch that that's your favorite lighting condition, right? Um, I would say so. I It's hard to like... Hard would, to pick. It'd be, it'd be close between golden hour and blue hour. Yeah. Because both of those I really, really enjoy shooting in. Mm-hmm. So. But yeah. I, f- I would say golden hour is kind of what I lean towards in terms of like, m- like my favorite images. Yeah. Yeah. Now for golden hour, how, how do you define it? Cause I know a lot of people define it differently. And for anyone who's listening that doesn't know what it is, it's essentially the right. It's after sunset and before sunrise, you know, it's that period of time. Now, a lot of people say it's a full hour. A lot of people say it's two hours. How how do you define it yourself? Like, do you? And also, I know it depends on like invi- like the atmospheric conditions and things like that. But like on an average day, do you think it's like really an hour, or do you lean more towards like less? Uh, I would say almost always less than an hour. Like, <laughs> yeah, I've never I like after the sun rises. I would say. It, like for really really good light i would say there's 15 minutes after yeah. sunrise agree on, agree on a clear on a clear on a clear day specifically it, it can definitely be influenced by just clouds and other things but on a standard day i would say that it's maybe 15 minutes of really good light agreed yeah i say i mean I, it depends on like humidity too so like i've mm-hmm. I say it's usually 15 to 30 minutes and people think I'm crazy. Like, no, it's like the first two hours. I'm like, "Eh," you know, (laughs) but, but yeah, as you're saying, it's really like the first 15 minutes is when all the good light is or the last 15 minutes. Um, but I've had a couple days last year when I was shooting shorebirds and I noticed it the most with shorebirds. Um, 
that I've had a couple days where it's really humid and it was almost a full hour. Like it, wow. it got pretty low and it just like the light just got really good. You're like, wait, sunsets in like 40 minutes. Why mm-hmm. does it look like this? You know, but <laughs> in the winter, it can be like 10 minutes, you know, and like a really dry yeah. day. It's just like the sun's up and it's like, oh, this light is amazing. And then you blink and it's like, oh, it's terrible. Um, yeah. But looking at golden light, what are some, I mean, there's a lot of advantages with golden light. So what are the primary advantages that you notice? but also what are some, like, do you have any downsides to golden light that you kind of like noticed when you're shooting? Um, so you want me to talk about the downsides first? Um, hmm. eh, let's, yeah, let's do downsides first. Why not? Okay. Um, let's see downsides. I would say it really depends on how you're using the golden light. Yeah, I think that sometimes with golden light, as if you're do okay, so if you're doing if you're doing like a front lit image of a bird, I would say that sometimes golden light can mess up with the the colors yes. of a bird, yes, and really just kind of wash them out and like make it look really weird, and especially greens. Greens can get really messed up by golden mm-hmm. light if, and sometimes it can look good, but sometimes it can be really challenging to edit and just can look really weird yeah so yeah colors can sometimes be messed up by golden light if you're if you're not shooting into into the light yeah um i'm trying to think of another if you're shooting into golden light like backlit i would say a lot of the times there's like there's some sacrifice in quality in terms of just your image is not going to be as necessarily detailed or as sharp as it could be Mm -hmm. um at like a different at with a different at a different time of day or a different kind of light yeah um yeah yeah you won't pick up as like as much detail a lot of the time Mm -hmm. like in the actual subject i'm glad you mentioned the color one because if you weren't i was definitely going to bring this up but it's like i noticed it specifically with blue you know so if i'm shooting Mm. an indigo bunting it can get really messed up by light and i was shooting a um pacific loon uh a while ago and this thing was like right there the light was really pretty it was pretty low right so it's good light but the problem is the pacific loon's throat is like purple and blue and really cool colors right so the light was hitting it it just looked black like it just looked like it was just a grackle you know um so yeah and then green on like the leaves and things like that too i've noticed trying to edit it as you were saying it's like it just it messes with the colors Mm-hmm. you know for front lit but those i mean i think that's pretty limited downsides for the advantages yeah. that it offers like what what are the advantages that usually come to mind for you uh just i would say adding color into just the overall frame and composition is a huge thing just getting yeah. that those really pretty oranges mm-hmm. and yellows adding that and then also the bokeh mm-hmm that you get a golden hour is just incredible. I mean, you can yeah. get amazing stuff, amazing bokeh with golden light. Um, yeah, and it just, I don't know. It just has a very, like, pleasing look to it. I mean, obviously, softer shadows on the bird. Mm-hmm. Um, overall, it just makes the image feel more, like, kind of dreamy and nice and soft, softer. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, the color is just, is amazing and what i find it works really well with dull scenes or subjects with dull coloration Mm -hmm. because we're going to talk about diffused and a little bit like cloudy and like if i'm shooting plovers like i do a lot of shooting with plovers and turns where i'm at and they're Mm -hmm. beautiful birds right i mean they're gorgeous but it's they're like beige and black and white and a little bit Mm -hmm. gray you know and then maybe their legs are going to be orange and their beak might be orange but aside from that you know they're not super colorful birds and then the habitat they're on is beige sand so the color you're getting is beige and beige and some black and white that's pretty much it so in the frame you know if it's a cloudy day it can just look really boring but with golden light you know, and that like, especially the first like first or last five minutes where it's like red, you know, what mm-hmm. I'm saying where it's just intense, yeah. amazing light. It just it lights up the entire scene and you go from like a dull kind of beige brown blah to like incredible reds and oranges and just insanity. So, yeah, I definitely think mm-hmm. color is the main thing that um that it adds. It's just really awesome. Now, 
for techniques. And the main technique I want to talk about here is backlit. We've mentioned it a couple times. You mentioned it in the beginning where they're saying, always shoot in you know, with your back away from the sun or whatever. Um, I know a lot of people around me don't really know that much about backlit. You know, a lot of people in the community on Instagram do, but you know, if for someone who's listening, who doesn't really know about backlit and it's kind of just in the mode of always shoot away from the sun, you know, what would mm-hmm. you like say to them basically? I would say just try putting your subject between you and the sun and <laughs> turn your exposure as far down as you can. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cause what I do see, like I, what I see with people trying to experiment with backlight too is a lot of times if they don't know, know what they're doing, it's all blown out and all the colors gone. It's mm-hmm. just, just really kind of horrifying blown out highlights. everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And really you really have to turn down the exposure a ton Mm -hmm. to get the colors to come out in golden hour especially if it's not like if if the light isn't like super red and super intense yet if it's like still kind of yellow you really have to turn down the exposure a lot to make it look good Mm -hmm. um what would you say is the advantage the primary advantage to shooting backlit over front light because i agree with you if you give me a backlit subject i mean not backlit if you give me a subject in golden hour uh, and you give me a chance to go for front lit or backlit i'm taking backlit 10 out of 10 times automatically but like why would you say that is like why do you feel like oh you like backlit so much more than you like front lit um i would say I feel like there's a lot more creative potential with backlight mm-hmm. versus front light. Yeah. Because with backlight, you just have a lot more, just a lot more options on what you can do with that sort of light than front light. Like front light, you can just get, I feel like front light is great for like, if you want a really standard portrait or something yeah. like that, but there's just not a whole lot you can do with it. Mm-hmm. Obviously it's a case to case basis. You can do really cool stuff with front light. Yeah, I agree. But with backlight, you can go for if you have your subject backlit on a black background, you can go with rim light, mm-hmm. which is super cool to play around with. Yeah, you can go with a silhouette if you if it's the subject's like in a really bright patch. Mm-hmm. Um, the bokeh is so much better backlit yes. than it is frontlit. That's the biggest thing. And overall, yeah, overall, I just feel like the creative potential and the chances of actually creating a unique image are much higher when you're shooting backlit than frontlit. Agreed. Yeah. And it's also, I just feel like the colors pop so much more. I feel like mm-hmm. everything just, it catches on everything behind it. And as you're saying, the rim light, it's just, there's so much more you can do. And honestly, this next shorebird season, I'm going to have to pry myself away from backlit. Cause last <laughs> season I got a bunch of good backlit stuff and honestly, not a lot of frontlit stuff. Like, cause I'm just so obsessed with it. And if you ever give me a chance to shoot like, Piping plovers, I love them. And they're back now. So I've just started shooting them. I've only had blue hour opportunities so far this year, but golden hour should be coming up here. Like one of these days, I'll get it. Um, and I'm I know I'm just gonna shoot backlit. Like I can tell myself I'm gonna shoot front lit, but I know I'm just gonna go for backlit automatically. Now, you mentioned silhouettes, and I know silhouettes from what I've heard from people, they're kind of a controversial topic. I, I really like them, but a lot of people don't. You know, a lot of people say it's um they feel like it's boring because you can't see the detail on the bird or things like that so what i mean i agree with you i love silhouettes if you look through my instagram like a bunch of the shots are silhouettes (laughs) right but what what about silhouette what draws you to silhouettes Hmm. i would say this is again getting into like just the creative potential of golden hour Mm -hmm. like doing when you try to go for a silhouette it just changes the whole scene so much from if you were trying to expose it for like just like with the subject still being some detail visible and i think it really opens up i think the biggest thing is it opens up a lot of use of like texture Mm -hmm. in the image and i think that you can by making the subject totally dark you can make it stand out in a scene where it normally wouldn't. Yeah. If that makes sense. No, I got you. Yeah. Um, like on a beach, if you make a shorter, if you expose for the shorter to be a silhouette, it stands out way more on a backlit beach than if it was, um, like if it was exposed normally. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and it, that just opens up I, it opens up a lot more potential for like small and frames, for instance, yes, because yeah. your subject stands out so much more as a silhouette. Mm -hmm. And I think it can just be very interesting visually to see the silhouette of a really recognizable bird or a, like a bird no one else is, no one has seen silhouetted can be really cool too. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's just the textures are really nice. Um, I really love what I love doing is finding a bird that's like on a perch and then putting foreground between me and it or putting a background behind it and then putting it in a bokeh ball and shooting that. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's just uh, silhouettes just look so artistic and I don't know. It, maybe it's just not everyone's thing and that might just be how it is, but I just, I love how they look, you know, that's very creative and you can do a lot with it. And the, I feel like the color also, it's a huge element as well. Yeah. Cause if you shoot like a silhouette, of like let's say a turn on a beach and you shoot a silhouette you're gonna get more color in there i feel like then mm -hmm. if you try to get detail on it it's gonna be brighter you know what i'm saying yeah yeah usually the most intense colors uh are really only possible with the silhouette mm -hmm. and the other like the other big thing you can do with the silhouette that i is like my obsession is you know getting a subject inside the ball of the sun yes yeah that's i just <laughs> that look of having the the sun behind a subject, just like highlighting the subject is just like, I love the look of those sorts of images. Also with the moon, you can also do incredible silhouettes with the moon. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, That's there's kind of so much potential. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of backlit. I mean, it's weird. It's, it's, yeah, I guess it is. <laughs> um, I mean, you can get rim, you can get rim light with the moon. It's, yes, it's true. essentially backlit. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of backlit almost. Well, I guess that the sunlight is coming from the other direction from behind yeah. the earth and hitting the moon. Technically, it's being backlit by the sun. <laughs> Technically, yeah, I guess. Now, um, <laughs> uh, one more thing I want to talk about with backlight is you. I just I just upgraded to mirrorless a couple months ago, and we were talking before the show about how bad the winter has been and not being able to shoot anything. So my experience with my mirrorless setup has been pretty limited. Now, when you're shooting with mirrorless, because you have mirrorless, right? You have the A7R4, right? Yep. I've been shooting mirrorless for two years. Two years, yeah. So yep. when you're shooting backlit in mirrorless, have how is the advantage with being able to see your exposure with backlit images? Because I think that's a huge thing. I don't know if you shot... I don't know if you really shot backlit when you had a DSLR. I, Were you doing that? I shot a little bit. Mm -hmm. I would say the biggest advantage is not being blinded by the viewfinder. Yes, <laughs> yes, dude. <laughs> Oh, I was thinking the same thing because I just so I just got the Z9 and I realized like, hey, I can shoot backlit without losing sight in my eye for a couple <laughs> minutes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it was so bad because I mean, like the plover, like I shoot the plovers a lot and they're so fast, like they'll they'll stop and then they'll zoom and they'll stop and then they'll zoom again. Mm -hmm. And especially when they're chicks and they're running around the beach and I'm photographing them they'll be running, running, running all of a sudden they're in front of the sun. And it's like, you can, you know, go for that sun shot in the sun. You're like, okay, it's game on, mm -hmm. you know, it's there. Oh wait, I can't see it because everything's white <laughs> because the sun is just <laughs> shining through my viewfinder. Right. So I'm really excited about, and I think, you know, this is a case for anyone looking to upgrade to mirrorless for anyone who's like nervous about it. I mean, just being able to silhouette the subject in the sun or just being able to shoot in that direction without being blinded. And also, I feel like with backlit shooting, you're changing your exposure so much if your subject is moving. Because even mm -hmm. a couple feet closer to the sun, your settings are completely different. Would you feel oh, the yeah. same way? Yes. Like, yeah, especially as the subject is approaching like that sweet spot inside the sun. Yeah. Lined up. the Your exposure is going to change so dramatically that it's just being able to see it in a live view is like really like that helps so much with making those shots even possible. Yeah, man. I am last year, man, on the D 500, it was just hail Mary. Like I would see the chick going <laughs> towards the sun and I'm like, okay, I'm going to crank up the shutter and hope it works. And then half the time it just, <laughs> it just did, you know, but um, oh, there was one more thing about electronic viewfinders. I wanted to talk about, Oh, I'm blanking right now. Um, Oh, Oh Yeah. I heard some people say there's a downside of you can kind of lose the subject in the shadows if you're trying to expose for the highlights when you're shooting backlit on the electronic viewfinder. Because on my DF500, I've thought about this too. Like if I'm preparing for 
let's say a deer to walk into the main highlight, right? More mm-hmm. towards the sun and I'm preparing for it and I want to get my settings ready for that in advance. I can still see the deer, right? Mm-hmm. Even though, but if I, I feel like on a, an electronic viewfinder and I think there's ways to turn off the viewfinder too and just make mm-hmm. it so it's like normal exposure. But I feel like if I try to prepare for that, I'm going to lose sight of the deer and it's all going to look black because the exposure difference. I mean, when it walks in front of the sun, you have to be like your top shutter speed and your lowest ISO yeah. off the bat, you know? So is that something you've noticed or? No, yeah, that's, I think that's definitely true. I usually the way that I kind of can get around that is that I see the, I'm like, I've correctly exposed for the subject as it's walking up to the sun and then I just switch it last second to the right to the right settings and then it just all of a sudden darkens and then i get the shot yeah yeah i got you because usually i will be i will be actively taking photos before it gets to that really bright spot Mm -hmm. so i'm already at a much brighter exposure so then it just kind of happens naturally i'm shooting it as it's when it's in the darker places and then bright as it passes over the bright spot i turn it down yeah but it can definitely if you're if you have to have a lot of time to if you're like already set on the bright spot and you then you definitely cannot see the subject if it's in the darker areas you have yeah. to just like look up you have to look above the camera to see <laughs> yeah. yeah man yeah i'm i'm a little nervous about that but i think the advantage there just completely outweighs that disadvantage because when i was shooting backlit i didn't even know if i was properly exposed i was like this could either be completely dark or completely white and the chances that it's actually you know because you know um, oh, i mean i don't know i mean it's so funny because I talked to some people and they've primarily shot mirrorless. So I want to talk about all the struggles I've been shooting with, you know, met dealing with, with DSLR for years. And they're like, I don't really, you know, know that much because, <laughs> you know, because they've been shooting mirrorless for so long. But last year when I was shooting backlit, like if I had a turn in front of the sun, I would shoot, shoot, shoot. And I'd have to look at my camera and be like, okay, it's mm-hmm. too overexposed. And then change my settings and shoot, shoot, shoot. And a lot of times with these animals, they're moving a lot and you don't have mm-hmm. a lot of option to do that. Yeah, but I did want to go into that because I think that's a huge advantage for mirrorless. Now, next lighting condition I want to talk about is hard light. So, <laughs> yeah, everyone's favorite, right? So, I guess this is going to be more of a shorter section. Um, but I feel like a lot of people getting into wildlife photography, and me, when I was younger, I didn't think about it at all. You know, people are like, oh, it's a beautiful day out, so it's a beautiful day for photos. Um, so, like, what are your general thoughts on hard light? Um. I would say, I mean, at just like at a certain point, almost any image I take in like harsh light, I just, I mean, personally, I just, I just don't like it, the whole look yeah. of it and everything. And I understand it just depends on what you're trying to do because some photographers, like I'm especially thinking about birders who are photographers, they're perfectly fine with it being like semi harsh light. Mm -hmm. They just want to get a detailed picture of the bird. Yeah. And you can definitely get extremely detailed picture of the bird because when it's, when it's really bright out, your ISO is super low. You Mm -hmm. can capture a ton of detail. And your shutter speed is super high too. Yeah, exactly. And for like, especially for like action shots, it makes it a lot easier. Mm -hmm. But I would say, I mean, for what I'm trying to do and for, I think most like creative wildlife photographers, harsh light just makes doing getting an image that's like interesting and not horrifyingly ugly is very (laughs) very challenging yeah 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 man i mean and one thing i wonder too is if it's i wonder if it's a natural reaction to how the shot looks and be like oh i don't like this or if it's like oh you know because i used to not care about hard light and then people pointed out the problems with it and then i saw it i'm like oh yeah i don't really like i mean compared to golden or blue hour this looks way worse but i want i wonder if that's more of just a reaction to like the societal view on harsh light more in the creative photography community. Do you know what I'm saying? Maybe I'm making zero sense. Yeah. I, I think there's some of that, but I also think that images in like good light, like golden hour people, like general, like the general people who are not photographers are more like those images better than harsh light. I would yeah. say. Yeah. Cause the colors I, and just cause yeah. of the color, because that's the thing is harsh light. It's all of your colors are just so messed up. <laughs> yeah like yeah. trying to edit a harsh light photo is just an absolute nightmare yeah yeah so, yeah yeah the shadows are so strong um the highlights are strong the colors and it like it makes like if you have a bird in a forest all the shadows even in the background in the out of focus background there's gonna be hot spots and dark spots and it's mm-hmm. just really confusing um now 
let's say you're out shooting and you come across a hummingbird on a really nice perch. It's in the open. It's like hard light. We're talking like really hard light. Maybe there's a couple clouds, but not in the way of the sun. So the light is still full force, but there's some clouds you could work with in the background. And let's say like you have stuff available to you. So you have background, you have foreground. What are some like creative tactics you'll try to use to get around harsh light? I know it's not usually available, but like, let's say it is in your ideal condition. Light's terrible, but you have all the tools at your disposal. What are some ways you'll try to get around that hard light? Um, I would say, I mean, my approach in the past hasn't really been getting around it. It's more been using it. So yeah. I had a long, or I uh, spent a bunch of time photographing chickadees in harsh light because I noticed that when the chickadees wing feathers were backlit by harsh light, they would be mm -hmm. iridescent rainbow, like yeah. crazy colors. Yeah. So I spent a lot of time just with a black background specifically i don't mm -hmm. it's really hard to make harsh light work if you don't have a black background mm -hmm. um trying to get that crazy backlit rainbow colors in the chickadees wings and yeah that's like one like especially with the hummingbird i would definitely try to go with getting getting those colors in the wings but a lot of species don't have that so it's hard to say like what i would try to do in that case i think I do think you can do cool stuff with silhouettes and harsh light. Yeah, that's usually my But coach. that's, yeah. I think you can do cool stuff, especially with just, with such strong light, it can interact interesting with, interestingly with, yeah, wings and other things. So it's really a case by case what you're going to try to do with the harsh light. Yeah, I mean... <clears throat> Yeah, my go-to, like you're saying, is usually silhouettes. Like, if I can get some crazy, weird backlit stuff with hard light, that's actually kind of fun. Um, also, if you have a dark background, but it's front lit, so you have a dark background and shadow, and then your subject's getting hit by light, you can make some interesting stuff there as mm -hmm. well, like black background. Um, but it's hard, you know? I mean, it's tough. Like, I remember I was when I was in Alaska, I saw someone... So I saw a red-throated loon... That was like 20 feet away. I mean, the thing was like right there and it was terrible light. I took like two images and I just watched it. Cause I'm like, I'm not even going to shoot in these conditions. Right. Um, and then I saw an image from somebody, I think of the same loon that went a couple, like a couple days later and they got a shot, this like backlit silhouette and hard light with the bokeh going off the water and some texture going from the grass. And it was like, it looked really cool. And I'm like, I wish I had thought of that. Cause I, I took a massive L there. Um, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> It's tough to work with, though. I mean, it's it's just hard. Yeah. Uh, there's stuff you can do, but generally what I advise to people like just getting into, I'm like, just, you know, just like go out and scout during that time. That's what I tell people yeah. to do. Go yeah, look for stuff. For sure. ha have fun looking at birds, you know, and <laughs> just, you know, I don't usually yeah. try to shoot because as you're saying, like I take a shot in hard light now. I don't even even if it's like a bobcat or a coyote or something, I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think, it. I mean, in some ways it's kind of nice to be able to relax during that time too yeah like during golden hour it's very like intense go go it's go so stressful yeah but it's nice to just kind of have a, a large a very large portion of time where you don't have to worry about that necessarily exactly. yeah during like golden hour it's so funny because when i'm shooting plovers i know i keep going back to the plovers but like they're the ones i just focus on light the most mm -hmm. with and like it'll be hard light and I'm like, I'm just sitting on the beach watching them. I'm like, oh, this is this is sweet. Yeah. And then for at some point, I can't like decide a line, but at some point, just boom. And then the light, I'm like, okay, my brain's like, this this light's usable now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then it's 30 minutes of just crazy intense shooting and stress. Mm -hmm. And you know, especially that last five minutes, the light gets incredible and you're like freaking out. You're like, where are the subjects? Where is yep. all this? You're like crawling around in the sand and whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and then and then I love how like right after the sun sets, I just always relax in the sand. I'm I like the sun just sets and then I just chill out and I'm like, okay, now it's blue hour time. Um yeah. I feel a similar way about diffuse light, which is the next one I want to talk about. And I feel like it can be really relaxing to shoot in. Um, but yes, can you talk about sure. like advantages that you see for diffuse light and it uh disadvantages first? And then I want to talk about advantages and how it compares like hard light. But first, like what are some disadvantages you've noticed? And with diffuse, I mean like cloudy, basically. I would say the biggest disadvantage is you have these really kind of 
especially when shooting over water, usually you have these really ugly white ripples. Yeah. Shooting uh, overcast diffused light. Also, like you're shooting in a forest, there's still going to be those like white highlights um, in the sky mm -hmm. that just can be really, really distracting. Um, I think the other challenge sometimes is a lot of subjects will just look very flat and colors will look very flat. If yeah. you don't, I mean, if you don't really know how to edit them super well, it can look very flat. Um, yeah, I would say that's the biggest. And then sometimes it's just there's less, you have less options in terms of what sort of images you can get out of a given encounter with the yeah. light. Yeah, I feel like it's all, it's mm. one major thing I have an issue with is specifically during winter and stuff when there's no foliage. And all the mm -hmm. colorful subjects are gone because I think this is both a pro and a con for diffuse light. You know, cloudy light is that it's not bringing in any color, which is great because it's with gold light. It's messing up the colors of things, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not bringing in any color, but it's also not bringing in any color. Right. So if you have yeah. a colorless scene, I mean, it's still better than hard light. But like if I'm shooting a barred owl on a leafless background, it's like brown and bright, beige. And yeah. And it's the same thing I was talking about with the shorebirds. It's like white bird and beige bird on a beige beach and yay, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's one thing I've noticed. Um, But also like what you're saying is there's no like you can't really get creative. I mean, you can maybe do a silhouette against the sky, maybe. But it's it's more of just your spatial awareness in the field and being aware of what's surrounding it, you know. Um, But I want you to talk about the advantages now because I feel like cloudy light is – massively underrated in the general community i feel like people are like oh it's cloudy i'm not going to go out and it's like you know um so how do you feel about like diffuse light and cloudy light um i think it's it really depends subject subject to subject on what wildlife yeah. photographing i would say where diffuse light really shines and is incredible is hummingbirds mm -hmm. if you're trying to get like a photo an image of a hummingbird with their like full you know, colors and iridescence, mm -hmm. uh, like diffuse light is the only way to go, really. Yeah. Um, because they just look incredible in diffuse light when all of their little scales are just all hit by the light. And hummingbirds during golden hour, you don't really get, they just look black. You don't get the same colors that you do with diffuse light. And I would say diffuse light too with, um, with portraits, they can just be very, Especially with the color, colorful subject, there's just something about the colors that just feels so like nice and natural when yes. it's um, diffused light. Yeah, it's yeah. I mean, it's not on the same level as blue hour and golden for me because it's not bringing in the mm -hmm. craziness. But like, man, if you get like a magnolia warbler mm -hmm. on like a little branch with some flowers, and in the background, like when it, like as I was saying, you know, it doesn't bring in any color. So if you have a bland scene, it's black. But you have a colorful scene it's like crazy i mean because it, it mm -hmm. i feel like it's the most accurate light at depicting the colors you know yes because with golden it's messing with them with hard light it's blowing everything up with blue hour i feel like it messes with stuff a little bit too oh yeah with cloudy light it's just it is what it is you know mm -hmm. and with like colorful subjects like a western tanager or an mm -hmm. indigo bunting oh my gosh and also it's more relaxing have you noticed that like i know i, I asked that but like when you're out shooting in cloudy light, you don't, you have all day, you're chilling and you can yeah. get good shots, you know? Yeah, it really helps you, I would say, really focus on cloudy. Yeah, cl cloudy days really help me just spend a lot of time with like a given bird or species and not worry about, you know, this is the, this is my one sliver chance to get the shot. And yeah. I can just kind of sit back, look at what, the bird or whatever it is doing and just kind of more time for me to kind of think creatively especially i would say with foreground like trying to find something cool to do with foreground too you just have more time to mess with it more time for trial and error um yeah it's definitely it's a lot less intense than with golden hour that's for sure yes yeah i i feel like also because people a lot of the time they have a really negative view of cloudy days you know and I feel like maybe I'm wrong in this assumption, but I feel like for me starting out, I, I'm inclined to say, oh, sunny is the best light because it's all sunny and everything pops and whatnot. 
But if you showed me two shots, one of them taken on a bright, cloudy day, you know, with just the right amount of cloud cover versus a shot in hard light, I feel like I would say the cloudy light any day. I just feel like I didn't know that that was cloudy light. Does that make sense? You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it can be hard to recognize sometimes. For sure. Yeah, I just feel like uh, the cloudy just looks can look so nice. You know, it's just mm-hmm. I just I feel it. it really just depicts what is there i remember you know last year it started drizzling a little bit during warbler season it was a nice cloudy day everyone left so i had the whole boardwalk to myself and it was like magical there was warblers and the light was cloudy and it was just like a blast Mm -hmm. um but yeah so i feel like that encompassed that pretty well um it's not like it's not on par with golden but it's also not i mean it's not like hard light. It's kind of like in the middle and it can be really good or not ideal for certain things. Like I won't shoot shorebirds mm-hmm. on cloudy days. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Unless it's like recently I did because the shorebirds just came back and I was excited to go shoot them. Mm-hmm. But later in the season, like in August, if it's cloudy, I'm not going to go shoot shorebirds. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, yeah. I'm just not. Last one I want to talk about is blue hour. Um, How would you define blue hour? Cause I also, this, I feel like this is another thing that people have different definitions for. Um, I would say blue hour it I mean it it starts when the sun sets and it ends when the sun rises and that can be that's just when it it doesn't necessarily have to do with like the exact time the sun sets or or um rises it's just when it passes over the horizon mm-hmm. uh or like the mountain range for instance cuz yeah. a lot of the times at least where I am there's lots of mountains so the, you don't get any light from the sun until maybe an hour after actual sunrise and that period of time still has like just kind of blue hour feel kind of yeah feel and colors is the biggest Mm -hmm. thing yeah um yeah so wait would you say that there's a time like let's say after sunset would you say that there is a time that it ends so like 30 minutes after would you say it's just like through the whole night if you can shoot through that would you consider that all blue hour um hmm. That's that's an interesting question. I I don't know if I could tell you an exact point where it ends, but yeah. I think there is, and then it just becomes like night photography. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I don't know. It's very slow, so it's it's not like sunset where it's like the sun's below the horizon and that's a definite end. Yeah, exactly. It's very gradual. Mm-hmm. I also feel like it depends on what gear you have a little bit too, because I mean. If you're shooting with like a Nike, like I was Nikon D500 on like a 6.3, and uh, you know, an F6.3 lens and a blue hour freeze, like 20 minutes after you're not shooting after that, <laughs> you know, it's so, mm-hmm. I have a couple of shots where I had this one plover shot from last year where I had to shoot at one eighth of a second. I had to bury my wow. whole camera into the sand, to stabilize it. So it wouldn't move. And I managed to make that work, but usually after one, I mean, after like 15 minutes, it's kind of the end of it. But with the new setup and the new uh, in-body image stabilization and then like the mirrorless technology with being able Mm -hmm. to see, you know, because with my D500, I couldn't even see through the viewfinder anymore because it got dark. But with the mirrorless, that's not an issue. Um, So I I guess it does kind of depend on what gear you have. But typically I say 30 minutes after, but it's tough. As you said, it's like gradual. Um, So what are like advantages you see in in, um in blue hour because i know a lot of people like the sun even before the sun sets they leave like they're like oh well mm-hmm. sun setting in 20 minutes i'm gonna go home right yeah <laughs> it's like uh so what are like after after a lot of people are like why would you shoot after the sun sets what are the advantages that you kind of experience with that um the biggest advantage i would say is just color again similar to golden hour the colors yeah. you can get in blue hour are just unbelievable yeah i mean you can just the, yeah the like dreamy like you know pinks and blues and it's just it's just like a whole different set of colors than any other time of day mm-hmm. that you can work with yeah and they're just they're beautiful colors too man it's mm-hmm. it's it's a it's totally different as you were saying because golden hour is like really just strong beautiful like here it is orange you know what i'm saying blue mm-hmm. hour is more subtle it's like kind of blue and purples and pinks and it's just really yeah. nice also for a technique that i know both of us use is including bokeh from artificial light sources in our images so mm-hmm. for people i when i have an image that's like this and i have like I, when i do a print sale or something like that people will ask me oh did you photoshop that in you know <laughs> um 
so how do you can you explain like what that tactic is and like how it works and everything yeah so with artificial bokeh really it's pretty simple i mean you're just you like once it gets dark enough you i mean you'll see like all the street lamps turn on and all that Mm -hmm. and once it starts becoming pretty obvious that there's like a lot of artificial lights on i would say is when i usually would start kind of looking for something cool to do with them and really you're just you're just basically taking those artificial lights and then blowing them way out of focus so there's these there they are these little bokeh balls that are much more pretty to look at than just like an in focus street lamp (laughs) yeah um (laughs) and i would say just using the that bokeh and trying to find a way to make it add to an image and make it more interesting man it's just it's so gorgeous and i i know it got popularized i think on like instagram is where it got popularized i thought i know a few Mm -hmm. people started doing it and then more people i just i can't resist it if i see boca an opportunity for boca from a street lamp or or a car or something like that i instantly go for it like no question Mm -hmm. to ask um once again, I'm going to draw on my Plover experience. Um, I feel like I've been doing that a ton during this discussion. But where my Plovers are at, it's kind of like a an inlet that curves around. And one advantage is it allows me to shoot backlit during golden hour, which is tough on the East Coast to find a spot that oh yeah do that. Because unless I want, usually if I have if I want to do that, I have to wake up at like 4 a.m. and drive down to the beach and go there. But with this inlet, I only shoot here because I can just show up and shoot backlit at in the afternoon which is nice but after the sun goes down it's pointing towards a beach and a town so all the town lights light up then there's all these people it's perfect there's like a parking lot for a beach and the cars all line up and just turn their headlights on and just sit there and just hang out at the (laughs) beach and so it's it's really nice but if anyone uh man it's hard to explain it's just uh, maybe i'll i like for the images i put up to advertise this post i'll definitely throw some up there so people can look at it because they're just mm-hmm. like they're it's just gorgeous. Um, now obviously you're shooting after sunset, right? So there's as much as like as many advantages as there are, there's going to be downsides to that, especially mm-hmm. from a technical side. So what are like what do you experience when you're trying to shoot in, in blue hour? Because it can be tough. Yeah, it can be very challenging. The biggest thing is just you know noise and pushing your camera sensor, mm-hmm. and that's something that's I mean. That's getting less of an issue now that we have a lot of like denoise AI and stuff like that, Mm -hmm. but it's still an issue with losing detail. And then the other, I would say the other really big thing is shooting at slow shutter speeds, Yeah, which can be very challenging if you're not Mm -hmm. used to to doing that. And it's just challenging in general when you have a subject that could be moving or yeah, just, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really noise and shutter speed. I mean, like it's it's just tough i mean you have to do you use a denoising software because i haven't started doing that yet um no i haven't and recently lightroom added or I was actually gonna like in the that. past week yeah they added a uh, denoise which is really good and i have been using some of that but before that i didn't use any no I'm going to have to use that. I I usually like editing on an iPad Pro. I love using the pen, but they excluded it from the mobile version apparently, which is really making me sad. So I'm oh, going to have to I'm going to have to fire it up on my Mac, uh, which I don't usually do because I have some images that could benefit from denoise to put it lightly. Yeah. Um man, cuz <laughs> I uh, the D500 was not was not the best in noise um and that's why you know I was mentioning earlier and when I was shooting blue hour, I was shooting this plover. I literally I went to one eighth of a second. I put my camera on the sand, put a pile of sand under my lens hood, shoved the lens hood into the sand and lined it up with the bird so that it was just stuck in the sand. So it couldn't move. Um, <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I mean, do you have a tripod that you use a lot when you're doing this? Um, I don't usually, I, my tripod is very heavy. So it's yeah. not exactly not ideal. ideal. Yeah. I almost <laughs> never use a tripod. I just kind of, find like makeshift tripods around to use mm-hmm. essentially yep. yep yeah like a rock you know and just call yep. it a, tripod. <laughs> a rock or <laughs> yep. a log a bunch or... of grass yep yep i feel that i mean i have a tripod i got from hunts photo and video uh shout out to hunts <laughs> no but i have a tripod i just 
it's it can be tough depending on what you're shooting also if i'm shooting owls i'll take a tripod i don't care you know but if i'm shooting plovers it doesn't work right and yeah i just think the low shutter speed but also i mean i think going back to outdated rules like we were talking about in the beginning people are like oh always shoot with your back to the sun or whatever the thing is like people are like oh you need to shoot double your shutter speed and if you're not shooting double your shutter speed your shot's not gonna be sharp like no that's just not true that's just objectively yeah. not true <laughs> or like you need to be shooting at i mean not double your shutter speed what i'm saying you need to be <laughs> that made zero sense <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so you have to be shooting at double your focal length, is what they would yeah. say. So they're like, if you're double your shutter speed, and they're like, if you're at 500 millimeters, like you need to be shooting at a thousand millimeters yeah. or 500 millimeter. I mean, thousand millimeters. Oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> you need to be shooting at a thousand, um, a thousandth of a second. Or if you're shooting at 500 yes. millimeters, you need to be shooting at 500 of a second. It's like that's just not true. I mean. With the new technology, the new in-body image stabilization and the new vibration reduction, things like that, it's just, it's amazing. I can shoot repeatedly like one-tenth of a second handheld mm-hmm. with all the stabilization. You So you have the A7R4 and the 200-600. How's the stabilization yeah. for that? Uh, it's really good. Mm-hmm. I definitely like handheld without any support, I could definitely shoot one-tenth of a second. Yeah. Um. I'm trying and then yeah without a tripod and using something else to stabilize i mean i've been able to shoot down to like 10 second exposures 10 second yeah and with a rock what yeah with a rock that was <laughs> what? yeah when i was shooting a uh, albatross with oh, artificial bokeh yeah it I was know. essentially night because it was about two hours after sunset and i was just in the grass and my camera was on a clump of grass and i took like over a thousand seconds? images and two ended up sharp out are of you thousand. serious oh my yep. gosh i didn't even know that was physically possible man i thought <laughs> i was like hey, i could shoot like one second with myself no 10 seconds <laughs> oh my gosh yeah i um man yeah it's just it's crazy people are like so set with like the old gear like before stabilization was a thing and i'm like if you're shooting over 500th of a second when the sun is even like at sunset you are even before sunset you are limiting yourself so much and your image mm-hmm. is going to be so noisy like if i was shooting above 600 and i was using my sigma on the d500 my shots would all be atrocious like they would just all be <laughs> terrible um oh, man the 10 seconds i'm still blown away by that i'm yeah i i think with blue hour though once again the colors just outweigh the disadvantages yeah it's tough to shoot in and sometimes you know it sometimes it doesn't work out like you have a really cool subject and i feel like this is a major letdown that i've had a couple times like something cool happens in front of you you're like holy crap i hope that worked out and you look at your shots and none of them are sharp because your shutter speeds mm-hmm. low. and that's something you got to deal with but i just think the advantages that it offers are completely um outweigh the negatives you'd agree right yeah certainly yeah i think so i think that's all i have to say about light one thing you like the 200 600 right yes i think it's a really good lens yeah i know nikon's coming out with one i'm looking at getting oh not looking at getting no i shouldn't say that at all i am i this is my first prime that i have i've ever shot with and i'm Mm -hmm. still getting adjusted to not being able to zoom out and i don't know how i feel about that does that make sense (laughs) It's yeah. weird. It's weird. I, I love the lens. It is fantastic. But if Nikon comes out with the 200 to 600 and if it has internal mm. zoom like that Sony one, I might go for that. Have you seen there was an adapter that could put a Sony lens on an Nikon camera? Did you see that? Oh, wow. That's really cool. And I mean, no, like I didn't see that. 95% focusing efficiency. Like, yeah, this one guy put a 200 600 on a Z9 and it just worked. And I, wow. I, I, I maybe, I mean, I, that feels morally inherently intrinsically morally wrong to do that but, <laughs> but yeah that that 200 to 600 is a really nice lens i might be thinking about that i don't know um but yeah so that's all i've got on light do you have any final thoughts um i would say just like for anyone wanting to you know to do more stuff with light i would say the biggest thing is just experiment mm-hmm. and don't be afraid to you know screw up when you're yeah taking shots in heart i mean like blue hour shots you just gotta go into that expecting most stuff to n- not to work out mm-hmm. 
But yeah. if you I mean if you just keep experimenting with it, you can have like incredible results. So yeah, just experiment with light and don't be afraid to mess up shots in the process. Awesome. Well, that was a great episode. Thank you for coming on. That was that was a lot mm-hmm. of fun. Yeah, that was fun. Awesome. Hello, everyone, and thank you for listening to this episode of Art in the Wild. I hope you enjoyed it and got some value out of it. I enjoyed recording it. Make sure to follow on Spotify or subscribe on YouTube or wherever you're listening to this. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you guys on the next episode.